Welcome everyone. I know many of you, but certainly not most of you this year. Uh, so I'll introduce myself. I'm Greta Binford. I'm the president of the American Arachnological Society and professor and chair of biology at Lewis and Clark College. Um, I'm connecting today from Portland, Oregon. Um, and I, uh, we're, we have people connecting from around the world. It's really exciting and inspiring. It's wonderful to see all your names and, and some of your faces coming across my computer screen. Um, I see names of scholars whose research inspires me. Um, I'm seeing the names of professional science communi communicators who love, uh, who, who share the love of arachnological information. Um, I see a lot of names of people I haven't yet met, um, which excites me. And I hope to have an opportunity in the next week to meet as many of you as possible in one way or another um, or down the road. Um, and I see a lot of um, very dear friends uh, on this list. So um, thanks, for, thanks for coming. But a beautiful thing is that all of us are here brought together by our passion for arachnids. Um, and uh, that's, that's, that's the centerpiece. Um, so uh, I'm, I'm actually kind of distracted by seeing the numbers coming. I feel like I'm talking while people arrive, um, but I think I need to just persevere. So uh, um, uh, welcome as you join. So um, I'm really glad everybody's here despite the realities of Zoom fatigue. And um, we're optimistic that our programs are gonna energize you um, even though we'll be sitting in front of the computer. So before the marquee events of the night, um, which are the keynote address by May Ann Andrade and the announcement of the first ever Platnik Award, I'm gonna spend a few minutes setting up the context of the conference and giving a gen general overview of what you can look forward to. As many of you know, this is our second pandemic-inspired, fully virtual American Arachnological Society conference. Um, uh, universe willing, it will be the last, uh, but I'll talk more about how we plan to incorporate virtual programming from here on out. Um, next year, we plan to meet together again in person at the University of California, Davis, uh, at a meeting hosted by uh, Jason Bond. But importantly, Next year will be the 50th anniversary of the American Arachnological Society. The 50th anniversary, so two things converging. So I hope, um, I hope people come. We'll remind you of that throughout the week. Um, but given that, I feel compelled to set the context of, the or of, of that origin 50 years ago in contrast to what we're doing today, right? Um, so the AAS was born out of small groups of arachnologists that met each other at other meetings like the Entomological Society Meeting of America. And they recognized the shared love of arachnology and just sort of formed these little, what, what has been referred to as puddles of, um, of people that, were, uh, that just shared the love for arachnids. The first meeting of the society was in 1972 in the Chiricahua Mountains in Southeast Arizona, a place where many of us have visited and loved. Um, there's an excellent history of the society written by B. Vogel, um, who served as the first president of the AAS. Um, the science, the society was launched under her leadership, um, the leadership of a strong and passionate woman in arachnology. Um, and that kind of um, sort of the, 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 the strong female presence in the society, I think, is, is, a, is, a, is a palpable thing. We lost B in uh, 2018, um, but Thankfully, she recorded a history of the society that Paula Cushing helped curate um, and uh, is present on our website. So thank you, Paula, for capturing that. Um, so I wanted to just give a quick quote um, by, this, by Charles Dondale about this 1967 gathering of arachnologists um, at an entomology society meeting where he said, I remember, the thing I remember the most about meetings was the sheer fun of meeting um, some other arachnologists. That's it, people who understood. And when I come to these meetings, that's how I feel. It's like people who understand this passion that I have for biodiversity. So you are, who are here um, are the people whose eyes light up around the love for arachnology. You're the people who understand. In that meeting in 1972, there were 37 arachnologists who gathered. We're a very long, long way away from being together in the Chiricahua Mountains in the Zoom environment. 
Um, and I'm sure the founding folks would have never imagined that nearly 50 years ago, there would be 511 total registrants for a virtual meeting that the society founded. 511, that's definitely a record for the AAS meetings. There's no doubt that this virtual platform helps us broadly open our arms. Um, and uh, I don't have a full set of data beyond North America, but we have registrants for this meeting from all con continents except Antarctica. <clears throat> and I wanna thank everybody that's joining us from far and wide to be willing to navigate the awkward time zones and join us and share, uh, share your version of arach arachnological passion. <clears throat> We're particularly happy that so many have, have joined from South America. Um, and I wanna advertise that tomorrow, uh, there's a happy hour meeting of Real, which is a community to connect Latin American arachnologists for mentorship and support. That's happening from five to 6 p.m. Um, uh, as a happy hour, <clears throat> so please go. Um, I also want to point out in terms of the set of registrants for this meeting that um, you all represent a wide range of circumstances. So in addition to researchers from around the world, we have exceptional science communicators, leaders in community science, K-12 educators, artists, biodiversity specialists working for conservation nonprofits and government agencies. And we have some programs, particularly happy hour um, programming that uh, can connect people with ideas for career paths um, in arachnology and peers that just are unified around particular interests. The youngest registrant is 11 years old, who's absolutely passionate about arachnids. So that's fantastic. Let's fan the flame of that interest, folks. Um, I'm sure we're gonna do that. Um, so speaking of fanning the flame, we have 93 total talks scheduled um, 45 posters, uh, three plenary, plenaries, and the keynote tonight by Mady Ann Andrade. Remarkably, the research presenters alone come from 21 different countries. Um, 13 are outside of the Americas. So um, we realize this breadth of the virtual reach and are so happy to have the opportunity to provide a platform for researchers in arachnology around the world to share their work. Um, okay, I want to just along that line, make a couple of announcements about the society. So <clears throat> the society um, just a few weeks ago uh, has launched a new website. Um, and the intention is for that to serve as a hub for supporting future um, AAS meetings, uh, including um, building in virtual programming. Uh, so we're in discussion to, to try to figure out what that model is going to look like, but we're committed to it. It's also a hub for resources to support scholarship, education, professional development, and outreach related to arachnology. And it hubs the resources that we can offer to our members that are supported by membership fees. These include um, supporting research grants for students, um, supporting travel to our in-person meetings. So when we do go back to in-person meetings, just know that there are funds there to support travel. Um, it also uh, it supports the, the Journal of Arachnology, so um, uh, it's, it's all built into this new website. So please check it out. We're really happy that it got completed in time for this meeting. And I, I want to take a moment since um, uh, about half of the registrants for this conference are not AAS members, um, and that's great. All are welcome, um, and we're glad you're here. If you are interested in joining the society and the fees prohibitive, um, please let us know. We have a formal sponsorship program for members from developing nations, and we're deeply interested in, in um, understanding other barriers uh, to membership and supporting um, membership for anyone who wants to join. So please just reach out and talk with us. <clears throat> All right, so I wanna make some announcements. That's it for just sort of general framing, um, announcements about this particular conference. So when the executive committee of the AAS met in January to talk about when we were accepting the reality that we would not have an in-person meeting, what we wanted to do with this meeting, um, we decided that we wanted to make full advantage of, um, of the virtual platform to expand the reach to, uh, of the participants, which we've been able to do. Um, but we also wanted to innovate and expand the set of programs to include professional developments, um, uh, uh, connecting 
people with shared interests and just a lot of fun. And so um, we brought on uh, uh, Catherine Scott and Sebastian Escaveri to help us uh, to think about innovative programming and they have done an amazing job. And so um, I, uh, I wanna, uh, and, and Rich Bradley contributed to that as well. Um, so I wanna just make everybody aware of some opportunities that are coming up. Um, so tomorrow at 11 a.m., there's a diversity, equity, and inclusion panel discussion um, that Mady Ann Andrade was gonna moderate and uh, with Mercedes Burns, Lauren Esposito, and Jillian Sue Karabski. And so that's going to be a, a opportunity to discuss the challenges facing arachnologists with diverse identities, um, discuss paths to success despite those challenges, and strategies to promote the um, DEI in arachnology. So please come. Um, at 12 to 1, there's going to be a workshop focused on actions we can take to dismantle racism in academia. Um, so uh, I, I look forward to seeing as many of you as possible there. Also importantly, we're having a bio blitz um, associated with this meeting. And so that will be launched tomorrow. Dust off your cameras and be prepared to go out and document the arachnids near you. And um, tomorrow afternoon, there are gonna be opportunities to learn about collecting, identification, um, online resources, uh, and community science. Some more traditional events, for those of you who've been part of the society for a long time, um, we have a poster session and today those posters are launched and viewable um, and I think they look great on the website. Um, so check them out after this event. Also, we have an online auction um, and it's uh, it's open. So go, go in and bid on those items. Um, all of the proceeds go towards student um, funds to support students. Um, also, we have casual arachnid night. So Rich Bradley is hosting that. Um, it's happening on Sunday. So submit your ideas to Rich if you want to do a presentation. Everything is welcome. So um, sh show, show and tell your beautiful slides, videos you've made as part of curriculum or outreach. Um, it's a fun, relaxed time. Um, some other things that are uh, available for everyone. There's a photo contest, an artwork uh, contest, and um, the voting is scheduled for 5 p.m. today. So look at that on the website if you haven't yet, um, and uh, place your vote for, uh, for artwork. Um, there's also a lot of friends, family, colleagues, friendly events to pull in pub the public, including um, a talk by Jillian Cowles, um, there's a live stream Q&A um, about arachnids uh, on Saturday. Um, the talk by Jillian is uh, on, um, on Sunday. There's a tweet arachnid questions to AAS Twitter. Meredith's the movie tomorrow night, um, 16 legs on Sunday, no, Saturday night, 16 legs on Sunday night. Anyway, there's just check out the website. There's all kinds of great stuff. Um, Okay, and I've been asked to remind everyone to upgrade your Zoom for the most, um, the, the best experiences for moving through breakout rooms, et cetera. Okay, so I wanna just um, uh, very quickly thank some people and, um, and introduce the people that you will need to connect with if you, if you have questions this weekend. Um, but first, I wanna thank, uh, um, so 83 registrants uh, had their fees covered by donations. And that's a beautiful thing. So I don't have the numbers for how many of you donated, but a lot of people donated to support the registration fees for, um, for these registrants. So thank you very much. A lot of folks are volunteering to lead workshops and, and um, foster discussions. Uh, so thank you for that. Um, I also want to send a loud thank you. So this year we offered up opportunities for, um, for mentorship of presenters. Um, and uh, we had a large number of people volunteer to mentor. And I know a lot of that mentorship happened. Um, I think there were at least 20 people that offered to mentor. I didn't look that number up, but um, thank you for that. Okay, um, I'd like to finish by having all of the members of the organizing team raise your hand, um, your virtual hand, so you can come up to the front of the view. And Sydney, if you could put us in the gallery. Uh, so there you go. <laughs> um, so Sebastian, uh, I don't know if Sebastian's out there, Daniel, Glor, Sydney. Um, Sydney, would you put us in gallery view so everybody can see all, of, all the fine folks that are raising their hand? Um, okay. 
I, well, I guess I have to do that here. There we go. Um, okay, so um, as I said, Sebastian um, and Catherine uh, did a lot of the work for programming, um, heroic amounts of work. Um, Sarah Stellwagen uh, did all of the scientific uh, programming, so the posters and the talks, um, she organized all of that scheduling. Um, Dan Glore, uh, our webmaster, has been doing a heroic amount of work building the content on the new website and making sure that website got completed. I can't thank him enough. Um, Peter Midford stepped up as extra tech support and he's doing all of the, the YouTube, um, we have a YouTube channel and Peter is going to be processing the videos and getting them on YouTube. So thank you, Peter. Brian Patrick, I think he's, uh, uh, has done a huge amount of work with membership and communication with, uh, with you all. And Paula Cushing, who is, I think, the core hub of sanity in, our, <laughs> in the society, at least my sanity, um, has been her, um, remarkably supportive. But also Sydney Gelling um, is our, our Zoom master. So she'll be at all of these events and, um, and we're really grateful that she stepped up to help. So, um, okay, so I wanna pause right now. I think we have 161 folks here. Um, I wanted to just pause and take a photo at this end of the conference. So um, uh, Sydney is gonna just, um, work through and maybe Sydney if you can unmute yourself and let us know where you are. So just pause and smile because she's going to capture these and fuse them together. <laughs> the awkward thing is you never know when it's your time to be photographed. <laughs> yep, I think I got everyone so we should be good. <laughs> This will be interesting. We'll do this again. Just, you know, maybe we can mix and match the mosaics of faces. But um, OK, thank you. Uh, wonderful organizing team. Do Does anybody, did I forget to announce anything that's important? OK. Well, with that, I'm gonna um, I'm gonna transition to um, the, our keynote speaker, so to the marquee event uh, of the evening. And so, um, I'm very honored and pleased to introduce uh, Madian Andrade, um, who is our keynote for the evening. Um, Madian is an arachnologist whose breadth of impact extends deeply with respect to um, multiple different directions. So, um, she impacts our fundamental knowledge of biology. Um, beyond spiders. Uh, her, she has, does amazing articulate creative outreach efforts and um, is a true leader in helping to improve equity and inclusion. Um, so I'm going to try to introduce her without taking too much of her time, which is a hard thing to do <laughs> given all there is to say. So Madian was born in Jamaica but grew up in Canada. She did her undergrad at uh, Simon Fraser um, a master's degree at the University of Toronto, Mississauga, Mississauga, I probably mispronounced that. Um, uh, and that PhD was in neurobiology and behavior, and oh, sorry, then she did a PhD in neurobiology and behavior from Cornell. Um, she's currently a professor at the Department of, in the Department of Biological Sciences at the University of Toronto, Scarborough, where she serves many major leadership roles, including being the Vice Dean of Faculty Affairs, Equity and Success. Her advocacy for equity and inclusion extends broadly beyond her local institution. For example, she co-founded and is the inaugural president of the Canadian Black Scientist Network, and she's the founder and co-chair of the Toronto Initiative for Diversity and Excellence. People have long noted her, her excellence, and in 2019, she was awarded the Ludwig and Estelle Just Memorial Human Rights Prize by the University of Toronto's Alumni Association and in recognition of her, of her work. But the recognitions began early in her career. In 2005, she was named one of the brilliant 10 by Popular Science Magazine. <laughs> um, so finally, then I promise I'll let her talk. <laughs> she is a model of outreach and communication about both science and about supporting one another um, in and out of science. She's been featured, for example, on NOVA, and she recently hosted an episode of The Nature of Things um, uh, and created and hosts the podcast, um, the, the New Normal. 
uh, which examines how the disruption of the pandemic may catalyze a more equitable society. Um, thank you, May Diane, for all these contributions. And we're quite lucky that Arachnids captured her attention and um, have held it and uh, keep her contributing to our community. I'm very grateful for that. So with that, um, I'll pass the virtual mic to you. Thank you so much, Greta, um, for that amazing uh, introduction. I'll try to live up to your <laughs> expectations. Um, but I, I, um, I want to start uh, briefly uh, by just uh, acknowledging that I am um, talking to you from Toronto, and I'm on the traditional territory of many different nations here, including the Mississaugas of the Credit, the Anishabeg, the Chippewa, the Haudenosaunee, and the Wendat peoples. And this uh, place is now home to many diverse First Nations, Inuit and Métis people, and I take very seriously the need to be uh, responsible stewards of the land that we're living on. And uh, I, I thank you because I think arachnologists take that to heart because we care about the land and the and the organisms that live on it, humans and, and non-humans. Um, so I am going to talk today about uh, my research, and uh, I want to just frame a little bit first that when I started in science, I've always loved science. Uh, I was actually drawn to theory more than organisms, uh, and I was scared of spiders. <laughs> so I'm going to admit that up front in this room. Uh, don't tell anyone. Uh, but uh, I have developed such a love, not just for the organisms, but for what they can tell us about the world. Um, my grand plan one day is to understand everything and how everything works and to have uh, entered that space through spiders. <laughs> so we'll see if that works. Um, but for now, I just want to share with you uh, that when I started working on spiders um, as a master's student, my idea was that I was going to do uh, a master's, a PhD, and then a postdoc, and that at each stage I was going to study a different organism. And uh, that didn't happen. And it's because I started working on Australian redbacks, uh, Latroductus species that lives in Australia and is fascinating, is gorgeous, and can give us entree to so many different theoretical puzzles that I never stopped working on them. And as of next year, it's 30 years I've been working on <laughs> Latroductus spiders. Um, and yet they keep um, giving us more and more uh, in terms of interesting new behaviors and how that interacts with ecology and evolution. So today I'm going to talk about uh, one part of the work I've been doing for some of that time and I'm taking creative license since it is a, a keynote and I know some people might have a beer and it's late at night. So I've put in a lot of videos, I've put in a lot of pictures. I'm going to summarize some things and not show you the data and give you the citations to the papers if you want to go look it up yourself. My idea here is I want to give you a full story of things that have taken many years to put together. So I will start with a the theory <laughs> because that is kind of what drew me in initially. Um, and I'll just say that um, one of the things that I've always been interested in is behavior. I'm just gonna drag my things off the screen because I suspect you can see a little gray box. Um, so I've always been interested in behavior. I'm giving you some punchlines here. And the way that we thought about behavior largely when I was um, a student was this way, that behavior was this flexible way that organisms can interact with their environment. So if the figure in the middle is the fitness of organisms in a population, so it's a histogram, and, it, and you go from the left with people who individuals who have low lifetime reproductive success up to individuals who have high lifetime reproductive success, the idea was that an organism is born and develops and then has a set of physiological and morphological traits, partly determined by its life history with how it, how it invests in development. And it can use behavior to buffer the way in which those things interact with its environment to result in offspring. And that over evolutionary time, that a good link between these things and the environment would be favored. But of course, it's not quite as simple as that where organisms have a set of traits that let them do well or poorly in a particular environment because the environment in which they are competing with other organisms may change. And so in this, for example, you have a male spider who's relatively small and maybe in one particular environment like the one I show here with a couple of females and some big males around him, he gets relatively low fitness with that particular phenotype or set of traits. But in a different environment, that same male might have much higher fitness. And uh, this is an environment in this case in which female density or proximity is much higher. And those small males may have some advantages, which is going to be the subject of, of a lot of what I'm talking about today. So we have a situation in which the environment can change. And when the environment changes, 
the fitness effect of a particular set of phenotypic traits, that toolkit you have to behave in your environment, the fitness effect changes. And so what has been interesting to me for quite some time now is the idea that we're not just talking about plastic behavior that can change to fit an environment, but in fact, over evolutionary time, you could have organisms for which the behavior that you need to do well in a particular environment, if you can detect something about which environment, the environmental state, that might actually feed back during your development to shift your life history and change the physiological and morphological traits that you develop. So in other words, you might have what we call adaptive developmental plasticity, detecting something about the environment that tells you what you have to do to do well as an adult, and then changing your development to move towards that more optimal um, trait. And so this is kind of a way of, in which ecology and evolution is linked because it's the ecological effects that over evolutionary time can lead to the evolution of plasticity. Now, plasticity is pretty cool. <laughs> Some of you will be aware of this example. This is a classic example of adaptive plasticity. These are Daphnia or water fleas. So in high school, you might've put a little drop on a, on a microscope slide and seen these little guys jumping around. They're very common and they are plastic. In this particular species, what you see on the left and the right are two individuals who are clones, genetically identical to each other. The one on the left has very large anti-predator spines, and those anti-predator spines decrease the likelihood that it'll be eaten by predators in the environment. Those spines only develop when the, when the organism detects the presence of predators during development. Otherwise, it retains that energy and uses it for something else. So for example, the organism on the right, genetically identical, might actually have more um, reproductive tissue than the one on the left because it had more energy to invest because it doesn't make sense to invest in anti-predator defenses when there are no predators. So this is an example of plasticity. And our understanding of plasticity uh, looks something like this. Uh, so and I'm gonna fill this out, this sort of uh, uh, cycle, and then we're going to walk through why I think black widows are good models for understanding this kind of a cycle. So we have an adult environment that varies, the little triangle there. And that is the context in which individuals have to compete and do well in order to reproduce. If it's this case that during development, there's information in the environment that reliably predicts where you are in terms of that adult environment and the things that are relevant to competition, then you can have the evolution of individuals who during development detect that information and respond by changing their development. And as a result, they end up with a different set of traits as an adult than they would if they hadn't detected that information. So that plastic change, if it's adaptive, will result in a fitness advantage in the environment that was detected as a function of the information in the environment. So in other words, you have to have the full cycle to show that adaptive plasticity is happening. Variable environment that can be predicted by some information in the environment. And the juvenile detects it, alters the development, and the new traits that they develop as a result actually allows them to do better in that changed environmental circumstance. So for those of you who aren't excited by, by theory, <laughs> it is just incredibly cool that you can have organisms that are genetic, genetically identical that look this different. And in this particular case of the Daphnia, they're instructive for us because one of the reasons we think they evolve adaptive plasticity, because it doesn't make sense for every organism, is first of all, they're very short-lived. Their ability to compete and reproduce in a very short time period determines their fitness. It doesn't necessarily make sense to have an adaptive plastic response if you're a really long-lived organism that will change the environments in which you're living over time. But if you're short-lived and have only one set of environmental conditions, then that's a different thing. In addition, we know they have variable predation risk. Which pond they end up in can have a radical effect on whether or not they're at high risk of predation and whether it makes sense to invest in these defenses. And then we know they have information about predation because when their conspecific, other conspecifics are eaten, chemicals are released into the water that indicate to them the level of risk of predator, predators. So essentially, what has evolved is the ability to tell the future and to alter your um, phenotype as a result. There's many reasons why this is interesting just in terms of basic biology, but in terms of applied concerns, this is an extremely invasive species. It's found worldwide. And one of the reasons it's invasive may be because of this plasticity, which allows it to um, adapt 
in a very short term, term period of time, not adapt, but uh, shift its phenotype. And the adaptation is the ability to do that. On the flip side, we um, are interested in whether or not this kind of plasticity actually increases the resilience of species. So as we're going through periods of radical climate change um, uh, and human interruptions into the normal um, way in which our ecosystems would work, it would be helpful to understand which species will be able to adapt to that in the short term or the long term, and which of them are plastic enough that they can survive the period before they actually become genetically adapted. And we're hoping it's not just cockroaches. <laughs> um, and luckily I'll show you, no, that in fact, uh, widow spiders seem to be able to do this as well, at least in the context we're looking at. So what I wanna talk about then today is uh, widow spiders. I'll focus on two species in particular, and I wanna talk about how they are helping us to understand adaptive plasticity and behavior and make the argument that in fact, they may be really useful models for a variety of reasons. I also wanna make the case for how important it is that we understand their natural history, their biology and their behavior, as well as doing sort of the, the more uh, advanced comparative work that, that for me is the ultimate goal, that, to let us see how evolution is working uh, across more than just this one taxon. What I'm finding, um, and, and I saw a recent uh, talk by, by Wayne Madison on this, is that there is a de-emphasis of the importance of natural history, biology and behavior as we become more sophisticated in the tools we're using to ask other questions. And I think that's a huge mistake. So the widow spiders or the black widow spiders, the genus Latrodectus are distributed worldwide um, with about 30 species uh, and, and probably more. Some of the work right now um, uh, that's being done is suggesting that. Uh, one of my students, Charmaine Condi, along with collaborators who I saw in the room like Jessica Garb are doing some work on that right now. Uh, they look like this. We, I, in this room, I probably don't need to show you what reproductive organs look like, but I'm going to anyway, because these pictures are gorgeous. Thank you, Sean McCann and uh, Mike Barr. So we see the male above there with the two pedipalps, which have these elongated coils, which are inserted into the female's genital opening at mating. So a picture of the epigenum there and the paired spermatheci. Uh, black widow spiders are handed in their uh, uh, insemination so that a palp on the left side inserts ipsilaterally to the right side and vice versa, and it never goes the other way. So uh, a full mating is when a male copulates twice with a female, which will fill up both sperm storage organs. And uh, you'll sh I'll show you later that that has some implications for whether a male needs to be the first one to mate with a female. Now, when they actually mate, they look like this. So this is a uh, photograph again by Sean McCann and a diagram modified from Lynn Forster's paper in 1992. The male climbs onto the female's abdomen and they're kind of belly to belly. Uh, and most of the species in the genus mate like this, including Latrodectus hesperus, which will be one of the ones I talk about in, in the rest of the talk. But there are some species, uh, particularly the redback spider and the brown widow spider, two that we know of so far out of the 30, in which males actually somersault or flip over using their pedipalps as a pivot point during mating. And that's what you're seeing in the video on the right. And you can see in the diagram on the left. So this is called the copulatory somersault. And about 60% of matings, uh, or a little bit more, depending on which of the two species you're looking at, result in cannibalism of the male during sperm transfer. This has been called terminal investment. Actually, I shouldn't say has been called, I think I called it terminal investment. I don't know if other people do or not. Um, there's other contexts in which you use that terminology. But the idea is that males only mate once. They can copulate twice during this mating, but 60% of them will die and will only get that chance of that one mating. Recently, uh, my postdoc, Luciana Arafaldi, did some work on Latrodectus mirabilis, which is a widow from South America. This work was in Uruguay. And she found that they are also cannibalized um, during um, copulation. And it, it's in a different form. Females kind of grab a male's leg, pull it towards them, and then eventually pull the male towards their fangs. Uh, but the bottom line is that this also results in a high frequency of um, cannibalism. So you have cannibalism as a fairly frequent occurrence in some species. Um, and in addition to that, the males are fairly short-lived, which is also another piece of that short-lived life cycle that may favor uh, plasticity. So I show you here redback spiders whose adult lifespan is about 25 days, uh, even if they're not mated, even if they don't get cannibalized. Uh, black widows about 90 days. And in comparison, adult lifespan for females is closer to two years in these species if they're well-fed and uh, kept in uh, good conditions. Females are multivoltine with overlapping generations, essentially. So when you start at the beginning of the season, both, sorry, I should say males and females, 
older males and females at various uh, de later developmental stages. Uh, they become mature throughout the season. So you get these um, waves of females becoming mature at different times and the same with males. One of the things that also contributes to terminal investment in this case and also in, in Western black widows as well as redback spiders is that more than 80% of males die without finding a female. And I'm not going to talk about the details of how we, we uh, uh, identified this. If you want to look up a recent paper by Catherine Scott, Sean McCann and I in 2019, we, we talk about this in some detail. But what's, what's remarkable here is that my study in 2003, the study done with Catherine Scott and Sean McCann that they did in, um, in uh, British Columbia in 2019, and also these two papers on Israeli species all find comparable high levels of mortality when males are searching for mates. So, this may be fairly widespread in the genus that males actually have few opportunities to mate simply because of high mortality during mate searching. This kind of terminal investment, mostly mediated by cannibalism, as uh, some of you will know, is relatively common um, in various places in spiders. I shouldn't say common, but it seems to have evolved multiple times. Um, and I should have cited here a paper by, uh, by Jerry Miller, but I don't, so apologies for that. Oh, there it is, uh, Jerry Miller, 2007, and also a paper by Misha Lick and Rishoff about um, sperm uh, limitation. So these species all have similar traits. High investment in limited matings, often only one, including genital damage or mutilation, sexual cannibalism, relatively short lifespans. Um, and all of these things come together along with intense sperm competition to lead to this kind of one mating lifestyle. So when we think about adaptive plasticity, about that cycle uh, that I was talking about and comparing it to what we see in things like Daphnia, these look like they might be a good model. Males are short-lived, they have high mate search mortality, which means that they um, are likely to mate only once and their fitness will depend on the reproduction in a very defined, narrowly defined set of conditions, temporally defined. There's variable female population density, uh, which I'm just gonna tell you is an assertion, but I have some data for and I'll cite, have some citations later. And as I'll show you through the course of this talk, that variable female population density determines the fitness payoff for very different types of male phenotypes related to competition and mating success. On the one hand, um, it's uh, males who are larger, who are able to endure uh, uh, extensive uh, energy expenditure during mate searching and during courtship. And on the other hand, there are males who are able to quickly become sexually mature and scramble to find a female. And those two things are in developmental opposition as I'll show you. So males kind of have to pick one. And then they have cues about female density, the thing that varies that can affect their fitness. And that can be detected either through pheromones, again, I'll tell you about that in a minute, or as a function of the time of season for species with phenologies that we can see changing over time. So again, black widows maybe could also tell the future. Now, I think black widows are a great uh, study system to work on here. And I'm just invoking here the crow pins principle. Um, and the idea was that for a large number of problems, there'll be some animal of choice on which it can be most conveniently studied. Now, when I talk to people who don't like spiders, I have to invoke this. <laughs> and the reason I'm bringing it up here is just that people tend to think about this mostly in terms of finding a species, a study species that um, on which they can test some particular problem. And I was really intrigued recently to read about a idea that I know some of you are already following because there's some great work on things like jumping spiders, um, where instead of thinking about a model species or a model um, uh, organism, to think about a model clade approach. That is when we start thinking about these broad questions that would benefit both from understanding what's happening with individual species, but also where we wanna ask an evolutionary question. It would be great if a priori we could start and say, I'm gonna find a species, not only that has sufficient natural history, life history, biology, that I can make really good predictions, not only that I can study this organism in the lab and the field so that these things are tractable, but also an organism that is within a model clade, a clade that is suitable for comparative methods so that we can better understand the evolution of whatever it is we're interested in. And in this case, I've, I've framed it as plasticity. So I've been working in, during my um, career to, to think sort of from that perspective. And I don't know, I'm 30 years in, you know, maybe 90 years in, <laughs> someone else will be doing the final comparative test, but I like to feel like I'm moving towards that even as I'm working on individual species and enjoying what they have to tell me about their own biologies. 
So black widows are really fascinating and I've had many different species in my labs over the years. Um, Dr. Luciana Verosfaldi did a large scale comparative study that on their mating behavior and how they respond to pheromones that we're working to publish this year. Um, Charmaine Condi has collected a whole number of uh, different ones for her phylogenetic work. Uh, and uh, Nishant Singh has been working in my lab as well to look at variation within Latrodectus hesperus, the, the Western widow. Um, so these are all these gorgeous organisms. I haven't done much with Pallidus, but I put it up there because it's Charmaine's favorite. I kind of think they look like, I don't know, marshmallows. But the cool thing about the Latrodectus species is what I have listed below for me for this idea of model clade work. They are very similar in terms of their morphology, their mating behavior, their sensory ecology, their life history, their physiology, genetic background, et cetera. But they're variable in things that um, the theory suggests would be important for plasticity and many other things that I'm interested in. So ecology varies, demography, reproductive rate, mating sequences, mating systems, et cetera. And they're found all over the world. So that can give us a lot of power to ask questions in a, in a rigorous way, both within species, but then at this comparative level. And this is partly sales pitch, which I'll come to at the end, uh, which is what I'm finding very common is that because I think we have tools, behavioral tools or genetic tools in particular species, everyone seems to pile into the same pool. Um, and so what we have is really well studied, uh, relatively few taxa that are really well studied and many others that are not. And I really hope if you're a young person out there thinking about studying some of these species, find one for which they're tools, but in which you can explore within that clade and maybe find out something new. So I just wanna talk a bit about the methods we use in the lab. I do really favor this idea of having both lab and field work. And so um, in our lab, we do rear uh, outbred family lines of whatever species we're working with whenever possible, right from uh, eggs right all the way through. This allows us to manipulate their diet, temperature and light conditions and social conditions, and lets us run, for example, life history studies uh, that in which we can have quite a lot of control over what's going on. Uh, and at the bottom of the screen, you see my fantastic uh, pandemic work crew, especially in the middle, Jashan and Ariella, who actually uh, kept us afloat and made sure our populations didn't die when in Toronto we were in lockdown, which was for quite a long time. So in the lab, uh, some of the tools to trade, I ask my students what they think is the most used equipment in the lab and it's, the, it's our video system. Um, spiders are kind of small and so we do macro videography. Uh, we also do a bunch of things with morphology and things like sperm counts that lets us look at uh, sperm competition. We like to do, we can do work on mating behavior, et cetera. Many of the people in the lab have worked at various times on signaling, on vibrations and pheromones. Uh, we also do some respirometry. Uh, Dr. Monica Mowry, who's now in D.L. Lubin's lab uh, in Israel, for example, has done some of this. And this is uh, showing you a recording of a male in a respirometry chamber. Uh, while we simultaneously record with a laser the vibrations he's making during courtship. So these kinds of tools are really great. They let us really probe what the male's saying, how that looks and how that might affect. Down here you see an image from, uh, again, Sean McCann from an experiment by Catherine Scott in which you can impregnate these uh, tissues uh, that's in um, extracts from pheromones and look at male behavior. And here from Luciana's work where you can do the same in this uh, kind of, uh, when you look at male searching behavior in response to extracted pheromones. So, but that of course is not enough. And especially in the case of looking at things like plasticity, it's really important that we also work in the field. One of the critical pieces is that variation in the environment. And not just uh, in terms of plasticity, we've become really concerned about this for everything. Um, because really what we're seeing in the lab can just be a select subset of the behaviors uh, and development patterns that we might see in nature. So people do work uh, kind of all over the world on these species as well. So for example, this is the Hastings Nat uh, Natural History Reserve uh, where various uh, students have worked over um, time. Uh, we were there for many years. I think people laugh because I think we use the royal we and I should say that right from the beginning. That's why you'll see all these wonderful pictures of young people. Um, when I was a student, I did the work myself, but now my knees, my eyes and being a mother uh, sort of uh, uh, tail, had, the, had that tail off of it. Uh, I think it's mostly my knees and my eyes. Um, so thank you to everyone who's been doing field work over the years because it's really given us a feel for what's going on. Um, this again is uh, Dr. Catherine Scott, Dr. Sean McCann, who did long-term field studies on Vancouver Island. And huge thank you to the South First Nations who gave us permission to use their lands. Um, and there's a, a bunch of uh, Western Widow uh, work that's been done there in that long-term field study. 
And then this is Luciana Barifaldi. Uh, thank you very much for permission to use this video on Latrodectus mirabilis. Um, so we can study them in the field. And in all these species, you can mark their webs and females pretty much stay where, where they are unless they're really disturbed. And that means that I often say female black widows are kind of as close to plants as you can get, which really allows you to then track what males are doing, who's getting successfully to the webs, who's not. And on the right, you can see an image from Catherine and Sean's research where they've marked a female in a way that allows unique identification in the field. So let's talk about plasticity in terms of sort of a case study. Um, something that, that a lot of the work we're doing is relevant to is the questions about male variation in male size. And so the question is, um, we have this system in which adaptive plasticity may make sense. Um, and the trait that we were most interesting at, in, and actually the reason I started studying adaptive plasticity is this. If you look at male black widows in, in many different species, and this is a Western black widow, what you see is really quite extensive variation in male body size. So these are two males, uh, in this case, reared in the lab with relatively sim similar diets. And one of them is 45 milligrams and one of them is nine milligrams in size. And in fact, if you look across species, you can calculate the coefficient of variation for male mass in this case. So that's uh, simply controlling for the average so that you can compare across species. And so this coefficient of variation for male mass that you see on the graph, the upper end would mean that there's really a lot of variation, some very, very big males and some very, very small males, whereas down here it would mean the opposite, that they're very similar in size across the whole population. And this study uh, from uh, 2009 is those, are those data for 210 different species of organisms across all of these taxa. And black widows are here. And in fact, the champion black widow is, is the Canadian one, Latrodectus variolus. It's up here and it's one of the most variable in terms of male body size or mass. So this right away means that this is a really interesting problem. Why are black widows like this? Not just remarkably variable to the eye, but with respect to other taxa, they show really high levels of variation in size. And so we go back to this adaptive plasticity cycle and start, uh, I'm gonna work my way through it and show you the data we have. So as I already said, as you know, if you study invertebrates, if you give males or any invertebrate a constant diet, if they develop uh, quickly and mature early, they will be smaller than if they spend more time eating and putting on body mass and mature later. So it, it means these two things are kind of in opposition. And with uh, now Dr. Mike Kasimovic, who's a professor in uh, Australia now, what we did was ask about how thinking about the different things males might um, the different ways males might develop and the traits they might develop, how those might affect uh, male fitness under different circumstances. Understanding that male body condition and size would trade off in a way that would, have, that would be affected by development time. So first of all, what's important about development time? Well, I already alluded to the fact that males need to mate twice and fill both of the female sperm storage organs if they're going to father her offspring or all of her offspring. And it turns out that it's more extreme than that. Male black widows leave a portion of their copulatory organ inside the female's genitalia. So on the left here, you see um, a male with two copulatory, two palps. And the first one is unmated. So he hasn't mated with his palp yet. The other one is mated. And the tip or the sclerite of that um, coil has broken off and remained inside the female. And you can see images on the right here in red backs, those remain um, and in Western widows the same. And you can find these actually in museum specimens that are 100 years old. So these are a really cool source of data. The success of placing these in a place where they will prevent the next male from actually inseminating those organs is about 73% in redbacks and about 78.5% in Western widows, so mid 70s basically. So what this means is that most of the time, the first male to mate plugs the female's genitalia and will father most, if not all of her offspring. So that means being the first male to reach a female who's just become sexually mature is a really important component for male fitness. And this is called scramble competition. So scramble competition then, if females are around who've just become sexually mature, this scramble competition or sperm competition means that there is selection to mate first and that would tend to select for decreased development time. So if a male in his final instar detects females nearby who have recently sex become sexually mature, selection would favor accelerating development to get to those females before competitors. And the cost would be a decreased condition and body size. 
But body size and condition, just like those spines on the Daphnia, you can't just kind of throw those away. Sometimes you need the spines and sometimes you need higher body condition or size to do well. And that would be under a different set of environmental conditions. And in particular, we're interested in the idea that mate searching, courtship, female choice and competition may all favor males who are in higher condition and have higher body size. And that is clear when you look at how they mate. So um, male black widows, we, we now think they may drink a bit when they're uh, adults as a, and opportunistically feed on prey in females' webs, but otherwise they largely don't eat. And so when they get to a female's web, the mate searching effort would have been based on what they gathered, uh, what they uh, accumulated as a juvenile in terms of energy reserves. And then they also have to be able to court when they get to the female's web and not just court for a short period, but court for hours. And in some of these species, um, it can be up to eight hours depending on the temperature uh, as well. During that time, they're producing vibrational signals. And this great video from Dr. Sen Sivillingham, you'll hear the, the laser vibrometry that I alluded to um, previously um, in the respirometry experiments. And you can measure then the cost of these vibrations. They go on throughout the mating. In fact, even when the male climbs on the female's abdomen, he's still producing vibrational signals. And there's a great recent paper by Dr. Sivillingham and, and um, Andrew Mason on that. And then when they're on the female's web, they're not always the only one there. And so males do accumulate on the webs of females. There's competition over females. And we could talk later about the sex ratio questions because that's an interesting one. But we do find on average that females often have more than one male on their web. And when that happens, then body size can be important. So here's a male, a large, relatively large male on the right, a relatively small male on the left. The, the small male did get in there and start mating first but the large male has um, engaged with the smaller male, actually bit him, and that was pretty much it for the small male. So body size then can affect the outcome of these competitions. And by looking across many different studies, which I've cited down here on the left, we were able to estimate that small males win about 25% of the time, that is they're able to mate with the female at all, but the large male will typically do better. They will either actually be able to mate first having engaged in long courtship, or they will mate twice, whereas a small male will mate not at all or only once. And the result is that they will father more offspring. So large size then can be important in terms of endurance during courtship and in terms of direct competition over mates. So if the environment indicates that large size or body condition is important, so if there are uh, females aren't nearby and males have to travel far to get to them, and if they're going to be in competition once they get there, then large size and body condition are important and that should result in an increase in development time. So what is the type of cue that males could use to indicate which of these things is happening? Well, for redback spiders, we thought that spatial variation in the availability of females would be important. And as I'll show you that they would be paying attention to pheromones. So redback spiders, if you think about what's happening in nature for them, uh, the adult lifespan for males, as I said before, is about 25 days. Females are maturing throughout the season and you find females at all developmental stages throughout the season. So for example, this male who might be detecting what's going on with females here has about, and this 25 days is kind of a maximum under ideal conditions. So he has about 25 days as an adult to find and mate with a female. Once those females are mated, and when other females become sexually mature, in the next kind of 25 day window, there may be a totally different type of uh, spatial proximity to females for the male who matures next. And that's because some of the females have mated and some have matured. So males need to be able to detect what's around them at any given time. There's not very strong seasonality in these populations. So there's the best predictor seems to be the local proximity of females. In contrast, when we, the data we have for Western widows suggests that seasonality does have a very strong effect. And this is the work in California. Um, this was uh, work done by Emily McLeod and also with Sheena Fry. And what we found is that if you look at the, how they, uh, the phenology through the season, um, what you have is um, overwintering uh, later stage juveniles and adults uh, here. And as the season begins in spring and summer, it's actually quite hot and dry and um, they begin to become um, sexually mature, or sorry, the females from the previous year um, are already mated. And so most of the females males encounter will be already mated. And also the density of adult females is low. 
There's then a hot and dry period during which most of the spiders become inactive. And we think that probably most males who are adults die. And then more males become sexually mature, the juveniles who had survived that period. And then the, in the fall, what you have is females who've matured over the course of the season um, are now unmated uh, at high numbers and males then have a high density of females who are ready to mate. So you have this seasonal effect where at one point of the season, there's lots of females and they're unmated. Um, at other parts of the season, there are very few females and very few of them are unmated, almost all of them are mated. So that means that scramble competition, this rapidly trying to develop to um, uh, be the first one to mate with a female who's just become mature, would be more likely in the fall, would be more adaptive in the fall. Whereas in the spring and summer, uh, with a low density of females, males should spend more time developing and uh, become larger and then be able to uh, compete and get to these females uh, through lo endurance, uh, long distance mate searching. Catherine and Sean found something very similar um, in British Columbia. So the season is not quite as extreme in terms of those really hot, dry periods. But what you do find is that the uh, estimate of the number of receptive females over the season does shift. And so does the number of males that are available. And in fact, if you look at what's happening early in the season, this is around um, uh, July into the later part of the reproductive season, which is September, again, you have high densities of reproductively active females uh, in the later season and fewer here. So again, selection for scramble competition in the fall and selection for sort of being able to endure longer mate searching and more competition uh, early in the season. Now the cues that you're using, um, we know that black widows are able to detect the presence and a lot of information about females uh, through pheromones and a number of people in the lab and others have worked on those kinds of questions. Uh, some of the pheromones have been identified and we know that this can provide developmental inputs that males can detect potentially and that could give them a cue about the adult environment. And we know this because this is a transient cue. So when females become sexually mature, they begin to produce pheromones, but once they mate, the production of sex pheromone uh, decreases and stops. And that means that there is a tight link between the detection of pheromones and the presence or proximity of uh, recently sexually matured females who are currently unmated. And so again, these two different adult environments would be cued by whether or not males can detect pheromones during development, during their last instar. So the prediction then is that when there's a high density of females, you'd see rapid development and a low density of females, you should see slower development and large size. And both Mike Kasumovic and Sheena Fry, uh, who's currently doing a PhD with me, have, been, uh, have worked on this question. So we did an experiment with, um, with redback spiders, again, assuming that they're going to be detecting uh, the environment in this way. And what we did was uh, confine males to environmental chambers in which they were in porous cages where they could smell the pheromones of other males and females. And we simulated a high density or low density of female environment. So females are releasing pheromones and during the final instar of the male, he's under these conditions. And what we found was consistent with our predictions, when males were present or in the presence of females, they developed more rapidly and they were smaller as a result. And in the absence of females, development was slower, they were larger, they had increased longevity and actually higher metabolic rates, which may equip them for uh, long distance, uh, high activity, long distance searching. These studies are, are older now. And so I'd like to focus, shift them focus to what we did with, with Western widows, but this was definitely consistent with our idea about adaptive plasticity. So with Sheena Fry and Emily and Cloud, we wondered about uh, that seasonal effect and what information black widows might be using to detect the presence of females. So whereas they can de detect pheromones, it was clear to us from the field data that seasonality seemed to be have a, a much bigger effect on whether or not there'd be a large or small number of available females. And in fact, in um, three years of population surveys, uh, the data for which is not yet published, we did in fact find that female density did vary across years, across fields, but most significantly across seasons. So that seasonal effect was significant. And so our prediction was um, that, sorry, so this, this seasonal effect was significant and what we predicted was that it was actually the cues of seasonality that were triggering male developmental changes. 
And so we actually just looked to see whether what we expected was true, which is, you remember, fall is scramble competition, spring is uh, endurance competition. And what we found is that when we collected males using pheromone traps in the field uh, in the uh, over two year period, in the fall in green, uh, males were smaller and at lower condition than in the spring in yellow. And that was consistent with our scramble versus endure hypothesis. So it looks like that might be happening, but there's lots of reasons why that might be happening in the field. So we've kind of ground proofed it that this is a reasonable, um, uh, uh, this might be happening in the field, but we do need to figure out the mechanisms. And so with Sheena Fry, we did experiments in the lab to ask whether in fact cues of seasonality were sufficient to shift males um, from one to the other, the scramble phenotype versus the endure phenotype. And so we manipulated temperature and light regime to mimic um, spring-like or fall-like conditions, and we reared males through those conditions in their final instar. And what we found was the piece that we couldn't see in the field, which is uh, the development time. And so here what we have, and we did two diets, which I won't talk about in detail now, but what we found in, was that in the fall, male development time was shorter, so scramble competition, than it was when they were cued with conditions of the spring. And similarly, in terms of growth or mass, we found a similar effect. So this was consistent with what we had predicted and what we saw in terms of the outcomes with growth uh, in, the, in the field. And, and these were all significant differences. We wanted to know though about the male's phenotype. So if we're gonna do the whole cycle, we see that there's a shift in development. We've predicted that it's going to have an effect on male body size. Um, in redback spiders, we actually did a field, uh, a follow-up in a field enclosure in which we showed that smaller males actually could get to males, to females faster than larger males if they developed earlier. We needed to do something comparable in black widows and we approached that in two different ways. One was to actually ask about the scrambling ability of the males who we had reared under these different conditions. So we have the males who we think are adapted for scrambling um, versus the males who are adapted for sort of longer distance endurance um, with more energy reserves. And so we ran them on a circular racetrack. And I feel really obliged to say here that once again, this is the royal we, as we say in Canada, which means it wasn't me, it was my student doing this work. Um, so kudos to Sheena for that. So we run them on this racetrack where essentially we touch them lightly with a paintbrush um, to simulate an anti-predator response. It may not be ideal for simulating mate searching, but it does tell us when the male is motivated to move, how fast does he go? How many times does he stop? How long until he just gives up moving altogether, which tells us something about his mobility and there's the paintbrush. <laughs> so what we found when we did these experiments, and I'm just gonna show you the data from stop frequency. So how frequently when males are being sort of harassed in this way, do they actually just stop moving um, and then we have to cue them to move again. And so what we found is if you look at the, uh, again, don't worry too much about the diets uh, at first. So the, the key thing is that if you look at fall reared males, regardless of their diet, they stop at a really low frequency. That is, they are running much more continuously than males reared in the spring. And again, scramble competition versus sort of more endurance. The males might be going slower, but they're gonna get there eventually. They have to go for long distances. That can be recovered so much if you pump the male full of food. So a spring reared male can do as well as a fall reared male, but only if he has lots of resources to put into that ability. So again, this is consistent with our predictions. And then finally, this is sort of the gold standard, and I love this study, um, show, and again, the world we, um, we did these uh, studies in the field to ask, but okay, we've done almost the whole cycle. When we actually look out in the field, and this is a much more field natural condition than we've done with redbacks, which was in an enclosure, if we actually just go out in the field and put out pheromone traps that simulate a female becoming sexually mature, will, small males get there first, as we predict, in fields where there's a high density of, female, of, of females available. So we looked at the order of arrival, we predicted male paternity, um, and we did this at a time of the year when, I shouldn't have shown this particular field, when females were actually at a high density. And this is what we found. So this graph shows you a log, a scale, male body size from small to large. And this shows you an estimate of his fitness based on when he got to the female and what we know about mating success uh, in terms of that timing. And what we found was that smaller males were in fact getting higher fitness. They were getting there first. And we saw the same result if we just did this based on the rank order of arrival or other kinds of estimates. So this really does look like males that are smaller 
in a high density field can get there earlier. So we've sort of done the whole circle. So black widows then and redbacks seem to have this ability to detect things about their environment. They may use a cue that's related to pheromones. They may use cues that are related to seasonality. And which of those they use, which of those we predict they'll use depends on us knowing their natural history and their life uh, and their biology. And then that input changes their development in this, terms of, this case in terms of body size and development because they're linked. And that does result in fitness advantages in the environment that triggered them. So this I think is, is really cool and it's something we've really been enjoying learning about. Now, how does that go back to this sort of model clade idea? Um, I'm just showing you this, this figure, which is just an illustration. I know many people will be like, that's not a phylogeny of Latroductus. This is an illustration that Charmaine helped us put together, um, uh, Luciana and I, when we were writing a recent paper on cannibalism and mating behavior. And the point of this is just to illustrate for some of the species for which there are at least some studies written that talk about mating behavior, um, if we want to understand, in this case, cannibalism, and maybe later plasticity, where does that occur in terms of this clade of, of organisms? And I just want to point out that when we were looking at cannibalism, we had these different things we were interested in. Um, and that was because Luciana had been working on Latroductus mirabilis and just found this new behavior. But this little blue box means no data. <laughs> and no data is the bane of our existence. <laughs> so again, this is part of my plug. This is, I'm talking about Latroductus here, but I think in fact, spiders could provide a remarkable ability for us to probe really interesting things about theory that's not just theory, but also depends on life history and natural history. And we need to convince other people that this is the case. And one way to do that <laughs> is to have these, the ability to do these broader comparative studies. I'm very jealous of those of you who can do it. And what I'm doing here is trying to leave these names up as long as possible. So people who are calling in from various places where we have very little data might think about going out and working on Latrodectus and publishing something. So is this a model clade? I hope so. Um, I'll tell you right now that if you're interested in working in one of those other species, we have a great videography system in our lab and you're welcome to come and do the work. Um, and uh, we'd also be happy to share resources and ideas about how to rear them and how to do the kinds of uh, behavioral um, observations that we talked about. Well, with that, I want to say thank you so much to the more than 200 undergrads who worked in my lab since 2000. A huge thank you to my lab, um, past and present. I honestly, I don't, I don't know how I would have survived this last year without you. You, uh, you keep me sane, and thank you very much for for everything you've done. And then finally, thank you to the widows. And I'm happy to take questions if there's time. I wish everyone could unmute and clap, but um, that was super inspiring. Um, yeah, jazz hands, everyone. <laughs> um, Mina, and that's such a cool body of work. Uh, so we have time for questions for sure. And the way we're going to um, moderate this, uh, no, please keep me Mad Anne pinned as well. Sorry, um, that was me, darn. <laughs> oh, oh, that's okay. <laughs> I don't want to be the one here in the spotlight, but um, there, better. Um, so uh, you, we're going to do all the questions just in the chat. And so I will be monitoring the questions in the chat and um, and speaking them to maybe and just to manage the, the crowd this size. So um, uh, yeah, I have um, while we're while we're waiting, boy, things are flashing by. There's a lot of a lot of super interesting, amazing talk, absolutely fantastic. Um, thank you, a lot of gratitude. Um, I love this idea of the model clade, and it's not something that we you, that language isn't used so much. But um, uh, can you speak a little bit to like strategies for you know early early young arachnologists and um, getting funding to do work and the sort of relative um, strategies of focusing on a model clade versus starting to build a new system or where um, where is a happy medium in that way? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, so when I started, um, I often say to my students, I would have the question period after my talk and I'd go, I don't know, I don't know, I don't know, I don't know, <laughs> you know, because they, everyone just had these great questions and I just didn't know that much. And Yale Lubin has done amazing work on Black Widows. Uh, Yudha Schneider's done some of the work. Uh, Jessica Garb's done, you know, foundational sort of molecular work. 
um, but there wasn't that much work done yet. So it was a decision. And in, in my case, the decision to work on this system and a species that wasn't very well known was partly paved by how cool the behavior was. And so I don't think people should underestimate um, the extent to which you can build a career if you have a really interesting question on a really interesting organism. And I, I think black widows have that advantage, but you do have to be careful as you say. So you can work on a new organism, but so for example, I went to the Toronto Zoo and they'd been rearing black widows there for years. So they could show me how to rear them, right? So it wasn't like I was going with no tools. Lynn Forster, who unfortunately has passed away now was the best senior researcher I've ever interacted with. She said, yeah, come on in, the water's fine. Um, I met her in New Zealand. Um, Daryl Gwynn, who was my mentor and my master's supervisor, invited me to go with his family on his sabbatical <laughs> and uh, work on redbacks in the field. So I also had a lot of these really lucky pieces of, of really great mentors who supported that work. Um, and I'll say on the flip side, one of my first, my first master's students started working on black widows um, and nothing was working. And we switched to redbacks for that reason. That was Lindsay Snow. So it also requires that your mentor is able to I think, figure out whether it's gonna work for you or not. I love these stories of multi-generational, strong, supportive mentorship. Um, so uh, we have a question from Mercedes Burns about the envenomation. So was the bitten male envenomated and do they not have resistance to their own venom? Yeah, you know what, I have no idea. And that is, I'm gonna to have to ask Sean and Catherine. Sean, um, I actually contracted to do a bunch of the videos and the pictures because he's so fantastic at it. Um, and when we watch the videos, it's like, oh, I've actually never seen a male bite another male before. I've seen them fight. I've seen them like one male, the larger males, um, when the small and large males are on the web, uh, the vibrational signaling clearly mediates a lot of what they do. So the smaller male uh, is detected by the large male relatively quickly and vice versa. And the small male will just stop courting. So the large male will actually court while the small male sneaks and gets on the web. And he may or may not get to mate depending on whether the male detects him. But typically it's just sort of chasing each other. So sorry, Mercedes, that's a long answer to a short question. I don't know. And I would love to know. Um, Denise Rao asks, uh, do the males that somersault do so so they can be better fight off competitors? Uh, we don't know. We do know that when the male somersaults and the female eats him, he fathers more of her offspring, um, uh, likely because he transfers more sperm. There may be other things going on as well. Uh, but what we find really intriguing about Luciana's recent work is we've got ground widows, which are in the geometricus clade, which is, um, I know we're not allowed to say basal anymore, but that's still how I think about it. <laughs> you know, the African clay. Um, and then we have the, the clay that includes North and South Americans. And uh, then we have the, the redbacks, which are in there somewhere. So did that somersault evolve independently? Um, and then in the South American widows, Luciana has just found something that looks remarkably like a somersault, but is mediated by the female instead of the male. Whereas in those other two species, it's actually the male doing a somersault. And we know that because you can take that male and mate him to a female of a different species and he's still somersault, right? But when you look at Mirabilis, the male mates like other Latrodectus, but the female grabs his legs and starts eating it. And when she's done with her legs, she actually pulls his abdomen in the same way onto her fangs. So that's another reason I want more comparative data because we may be able to see some really interesting um, steps that led to male sacrifice in some, but female mediated cannibalism in others. And uh, yeah, and I don't know if I answered the question. <laughs> We'll say yes, yes. <laughs> um, so Rebecca, I, as a great dovetail for that, Rebecca Godwin, um, who's a new faculty member at a small liberal arts college, is um, is asking about uh, the role of, or discussing the role of undergraduates. So with undergraduate mentorship, you have to pick a small, feasible scale projects. And um, the, the unknown aspects of natural history could be a great way to plug into that. Yeah, I agree. And I, um, we've done a lot of work with undergraduates over the year. And thanks to some of my students in the room who've mentored them. Uh, having spiders in the lab is gold for undergraduate research projects. So whereas it, my, my department has actually undergraduate research courses that range from shadowing a grad student in second year all the way up uh, and includes like a, a, a collaborative project with three or four students all the way up to your own sort of thesis for a year. 
Um, and one of them is a one-term project that's usually a literature-based project. When they come to my lab, they do a research project because we have these animals, right? So you can, you can have them track things like the life history changes, development time, body size. Um, unfortunately, we don't do any field work in my lab because the Latrodectus variolus populations aren't quite big enough um, yet. So climate change will be our friend eventually, unfortunately, in that one way, because the populations are growing. Um, Chris Buttle and colleagues in Montreal have shown that. Interesting. And you have such a deep bed of background and knowledge that the questions must be sprouting off um, uh, for undergraduate projects. That's great. Yeah. Um, so how, there are a lot of questions. I'll, I'll do a, a few more here. But um, so Mark Millen asked, um, do you suspect that similar trade-offs would also exist in other spider species that use mating plugs? Um, I do. Uh, and I know, for example, Jutta Schneider and colleagues have done um, plasticity studies on three species, which whose names I'm now forgetting, uh, of orb weavers. And she found two of the three showed off the similar kind of evidence of adaptive plasticity, um, short-lived males um, and sacrifice. So I'll, I'll dig up those papers and put them somewhere. I assume you have a chat something or the other. So I'll find those papers. But um, I think other species may be doing it too. And I would love it if people were to look at it. There's, there's a whole animal behavior issue on socially cued anticipatory plasticity. Um, if you want to look about into the uh, sort of theoretical reasons why you might see it. But you know, pheromones plus short-lived plus plugs, gold. <laughs> I love it. We'll figure out a, a vehicle for sharing these resources um, okay. uh, for participants here. Um, Dave Richmond has heard a rumor that there are maybe two, a second species of Latrodectus in, in the Western, um, in Western North America. Um, do you have any insight or thoughts about that? Oh, <laughs> um, so uh, uh, Catherine, uh, sorry, uh, Charmaine Condi is actually working on that paper right now. And, um, and also Nishant Singh is looking at variation across the, the range. So stay tuned, I'm sure by next, Arachnology meeting, we'll have cool stuff to say about that, but I'm keeping my lips closed for now. <laughs> All right, we we'll look forward to that. Which I think probably gives you an answer. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. Um, okay, I'll do I'll do two more, um, and we'll save the chat and uh, send them to maybe Anne. So, um, uh, so uh, Doug Douglas Gappin says, "Thank you for your talk. Are you thinking about selected uncoiling of DNA?" methylation, directed mutagenesis, or other for uncovering plastic variation? Yeah, I would actually love to do some of that with a collaborator. So, um, so far we've done very little. Um, Charmaine has some work that is going to look at um, our, uh, gene expression. So um, transcriptomes in juveniles versus adults, but that was really looking at something totally different. Uh, so I would love to know the mechanism. And I feel like if we actually have this system where we can trigger the mechanism, it would it would mean that we could, if we had the genetic tools, we could do some interesting stuff. So if you're interested, please do get in touch. We're happy to send you spiders that we've done all sorts of weird natural, you know, life history things too. Great. Um, Meg Yodge asked a, a similar question about gene expression. Um, so, and somebody's curious about the Kathleen Bradley about the beautiful sculpture behind your on the wall behind you. <laughs> oh, this little. This guy? My daughter brought it home from a trip to, where did she go? Uh, Costa Rica. I think the I circular, that's cool. I think is this the, the one? This isn't it? Oh, this that, that's from ball. Haiti. That's recovered tin from Haiti. Cool, cool, all right. It is kind of cool. <laughs> <laughs> the fun of welcoming each other into the living room. Um, yeah, exactly. Welcome to my home. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so, um, I'll uh, just hop forward to Dante Poi, and this will be the last one. Um, uh, so Dante says, amazing work, Median. I, I guess that the density of females is a really good predictor for the male size, but could you tell if there's any effect of the female cannibalism in male body size? Um, he recalls a paper by Wilder and Ripstra who found that female neph um, nephilids eat uh, bigger males. Oh, that's interesting. Um, no, we haven't found any signal of female choice of like larger males or anything. Um, because of their extreme dimorphism, males are kind of really a snack, like they're not that big. But having said that, uh, there's a paper out of, um, uh, with Catherine 
Barry and I think Sean Wilder I might have seen here um, in the room. Uh, and the first author is, I believe, Luc Boisseau. And they found that eating male black widow, male redbacks actually has an effect on offspring either size or, or fitness. And I can't remember which it is. But so there is an effect of eating males that females get something out of that other than just food, apparently. Um, but I don't know if male size has an effect on that. Awesome. Um, we will make sure you get all the other questions that are lingering in the chat. And um, thank you for everybody that submitted those. Um, and Medium, I, I, I just want to remind everybody that tomorrow Medium will be moderating the, a panel for DEI, and I'm grateful for that. But also, just thank you for being an inspiration for sharing this long legacy of building this model system upon which more and more sophisticated questions are being asked and answered and um, building a background of, of um, knowledge that matches, that confirms theoretical predictions. That is so cool. You inspire me. Um, so oh, thank you for that. <clears throat> okay. So with that, we're gonna transition to, um, to the other event of tonight. Um, <clears throat> so, uh, so we're going to be announcing the inaugural winner of the first um, or, of the uh, Norman Platnick Award for Taxonomic Research in Arachnology. Um, this is a very special uh, moment. Um, so I think probably all are aware that um, we lost Norm Platnick, who was such a, a deep and broad influencer of arachnology um, last April. And um, we are very pleased to be able to, in his honor, offer um, this award for early career excellence in um, taxonomy and arachnology. So last year, our keynote was um, Martin Ramirez, who gave a beautiful talk about, um, about Norm and his, and his life and legacy. Um, we have a link to that talk on the website and um, slides associated with that talk. Um, this year, we, since this is the first presentation, we wanted to add a little bit more depth of context um, about Norm. So what's going to happen now is I'm going to transition to Gustavo Ormiga, um, who will give a, a, like a 10 minute background about Norm and then um, Mark Harvey will step in and announce the winner um, in an Oscar, Oscar style way. The only people who know the winner are the members of the committee and me. So um, we're excited about that. But just briefly, um, so uh, Gustavo um, had a very close working relationship with Norm. He first, um, so Gustavo, everybody probably knows Gustavo, but he's a professor at George Washington University. Hi, Gustavo. Um, <clears throat> and uh, he first met Norm in, uh, back in 1986 in Spain um, and then worked closely with him when he came to the US for grad school at the University of Maryland um, and ever since and uh, just acknowledges how supportive he was. Um, and he worked with Norm extensively on the um, uh, Goblin Spider Planetary Bio Inventory initi Initiative, um, Inventory, sorry, Planetary Biodiversity Initiative Project, um, and the Spider Families of the World book that just came out a few weeks after Norm's death. So um, thank you, Gustavo, for, for um, building that information more, more deeply. Thank you, uh, Greta. Um, can you guys hear me uh, fine? Yes. Yes. I'm great. Okay, so let me. I'm. I'm going to start sharing my screen. Um, okay. Uh, all right. Okay. There we go. So, um, well, first of all, thank you for the opportunity um, to say a few uh, words about uh, Norm. Thank you the, to, the, uh, to the committee for, for asking me to do this. Though oh, once I agreed and began to think about it, I thought, well, you know, 10 minutes to talk about Norm seems like uh, an impossible challenge uh, because, you know, he was so influential and he accomplished so much that it's really literally impossible to, um, to really um, honor him with just um, 10 minutes. So what I'd like to do is to go over, you know, how this exactly um, happened that uh, uh, we got this fund. Uh, the very same day that Norm uh, passed away, his son um, Will contacted me uh, because he wanted to start a, a you know, a go fund me, uh, um, to raise money for, for a memorial fund to, 
to honor uh, his dad. And he wanted to see if I could put him in contact with the American Arachnological Society, which I immediately did. And, uh, you know, the, fund, the funding campaign, you know, very quickly reached the, uh, the target. And the uh, um, uh, award was uh, set up to be administered by the American Arachnological Society, essentially to honor early career researchers with a strong commitment to morphological uh, taxonomy. So Mark Harvey will talk a little bit more about this um, after I finish uh, my, my short uh, uh, presentation. And as I said, you know, to talk about norm in 10 minutes is really an impossible task, but I would like to direct you to a few things. One, uh, uh, Greta already mentioned, is the wonderful presentation that Martin Ramirez uh, did last year during the uh, Congress, during the uh, meeting, um, which is accessible through the meeting website. Uh, and then there is a very nice, um, very thorough uh, biographical sketch by Lorenzo Prendini from the American Museum about Norm. And then there is also that if you haven't read, I really encourage you to, um, to check in uh, Wayne Madison's uh, blog, um, his personal uh, um, view and, you know, and basically interpretation of the, of the uh, legacy of Norm planning. And that's, that's a really, you know, personal, uh, wonderful uh, note that Wayne um, wrote there. And um, in there, you can actually read uh, what I have uh, now extracted in this uh, quote. And Norm, you know, basically, well, Norm worked on many things, but essentially you could say that he worked on empirical um, taxonomy of uh, spiders, recent knowledge as well, on biodiversity informatics and in systematic theory. And in any of those disciplines, he was really, really a tour of, of force. And had he done work exclusively in any of those three areas, what he actually accomplished working on the three of them simultaneously would still be, you know, uh, uh, celebrating his efforts in that field. So. That makes it very, very challenging to, to speak about this man in such a short period of time. Norm was extremely prolific, more than 12,000 printed pages. Uh, but you can be prolific and you can be prolific in high quality uh, output and writing. And Norm, you know, actually uh, uh, wrote some really wonderful influential papers. So he, he produced quantity and quality almost uh, 350 uh, publications, including uh, some very extensive uh, monographs. And, and, and um, he was absolutely fearless in approaching spider diversity. He, he worked on um, species, on groups, on, on 49 uh, uh, families. Uh, today we have 129 families. Yeah, when we wrote uh, the, uh, the spider book that just came out published, Last year, I think there were about 120. So he basically worked on, on everything, he described over 2,000 species of spiders and some recently as well, and, and lots of, uh, of new genera. And so when I was thinking about, you know, so I want to focus in these very few minutes on Norm's taxonomic um, output. And when I, when I try to put this into context, uh, the metaphor that came to my mind uh, was this of, a, of an impossible lens. So Norm saw spider diversity through this optically impossible lens that produces extremely sharp images, both at the very close up level, at the macro level, and as well, uh, the wide angle, the fish eye lens, and everything in between but not only extremely sharp images, also with great depth of, of, of uh, field. So that's of course impossible in an optical lens, but his work actually accomplished that. And here are two examples from the sort of like the brother uh, picture, an early paper with uh, Willis Gersh, who had been a curator for a long time at the American Museum in New York uh, on the three main lineages of spiders at that time you know, recognize as supporters. So, uh, and then at the other end, you have something for, for, from, from his um, uh, later uh, years, one of the many um, monographs that he uh, 
wrote on um, on opet spiders in, in in many of them in collaboration with uh, with uh, various people including the uh, scientific assistant uh, at that time uh, Nadine Dupere um, and for norm and for many people the gold standard of taxonomic work is the monograph the taxonomic monograph so a monograph um, uh, the monographic approach consists on identifying a putative monophyletic group, a clade, and then actually revising uh, um, everything in that clade. Uh, and so the, the problem is defined by the same with modification by, by, by natural groups, by monophyletic groups, right? So that's what circumscribes the problem. And, uh, and that uh, produces the, the best quality work. This is not always possible. Uh, but uh, the group is not um, seldom is seldom um, defined by the location or the region is defined by being part of a lineage. Uh, and of course, this is, as I was saying, not always possible. And uh, sometimes uh, uh, there are regional uh, approaches and Norm have done uh, uh, some of those as well, some of those papers, but this was uh, the gold standard uh, and uh, for, for norm and, you know, for the scientific community in general. And this is norm's motto, you know, the best is not too good. And as an example, um, I was uh, uh, showing you the cover of this uh, monograph on the Lamponid uh, spiders, which is a group of uh, naphosoids from, from Australasia. Now, this is a massive uh, undertaking you know, it ended having um, over 300 pages, um, more than 800 figures. And so in there, um, it, it sole author uh, uh, was uh, Norm, uh, described 190 species and, and um, 16 new genera. Now, uh, for a taxonomist that has some idea of the amount of work that something, an undertaking of this nature uh, encompasses, I mean, you think about, I think about it and it, it makes you dizzy. I mean, we're talking, um, you know, basically an unknown fauna as often happens in some groups in Australia and having sort of like this vision because Norm had a very clear compass on how to navigate arachnid diversity. And, and that compass was set early in his career and he followed the course decade after um, decade. And, and one of the things that was, uh, is the, one of the reasons why the monographic approach um, is, is the way to go is because that's, that's the way to identify uh, synonyms. That's the, uh, and a synonym, as, as you know, I think most of you probably know, it's basically when you have two different names for the same uh, species. So you don't want to have that. You just want to have a one-to-one -one correspondence. So part of the monographic approach uh, uh, consist of doing, you know, a thorough uh, laundry job and finding out, you know, what are those names that are already existing. Sometimes the names uh, are, you know, in other groups. So you have to actually do, do a lot of digging out. And that comes with, you know, with a good monograph. And Norm had sort of like, if you think about it, a little bit of a radical, uh, you know, uh, um, approach to it in the sense that for him, at the beginning of a problem, everything, every specimen was the same species. And it was up to you, to the, to the taxonomist, to find additional evidence to support, you know, uh, that there were more than one um, species. So, so this sort of uh, um, methodological compass, he, he followed throughout uh, his um, career. And this is, again, extracted from this Lamponid monograph from uh, from 20 years ago. And uh, if you are a taxonomist and if you use a normal paper, you'll recognize uh, um, uh, this, this sort of like model from, you know, papers from 20, uh, 30 years ago, these beautiful illustrations from uh, Mohammed uh, Shadab. Also, um, you know, uh, the support uh, work done um, over a very long time by, by his assistant, uh, Lou Sorkin. So, uh, and, and the typical monograph actually defines the groups um, by, by finding synapomorphies, by finding uh, um, shared derived traits 
that determine, you know, the, the genera or families, subfamilies, and so on. And most uh, often this is done nowadays using uh, um, um, matrices and doing cladistic analysis. Of course, we, we advanced uh, over the years on this model uh, and we have mo a multi-layer approach often referred as integrative taxonomy where different lines of evidence, for example, sequence data are added to resolve uh, this problem. But uh, Norm had you know, very high standards for this uh, uh, kind of work. And, and this is something that we are trying to honor with this, um, with this award. And the ultimate, uh, the ultimate um, monograph, so to speak, uh, uh, from uh, uh, Norm and collaborators was this project that was um, led by Norm and a few other people, uh, including myself, uh, um, in which uh, basically Norm came up with the idea, I'm going to take this group, the, uh, the uh, Onopid spiders, for which uh, Charles Griswold uh, should be credited for coining the common now common name of goblin spiders, and said, well, you know, this is a relatively, you know, um, a small group in terms of the number of species with, uh, with a predicted very high diversity. And so he put together a team of more than 30 uh, researchers in 10 countries. And basically we all tackle the uh, global diversity of, of onopids. So it's important um, to, and I, I want to actually bring out some, some context of how science was before these um, planetary biotic inventories. At some point, there was a debate among biodiversity scientists with two different positions, the more ecological positions of the so-called ATBI, all taxa biotic inventories. Basically, we're going to go into an area and we're going to describe everything in that area. So one of the major proponents of this approach uh, was the um, tropical ecologist Dan Jansen. And of course, Dan Jansen said, well, let's go to this spot in the Guanacaste province in Costa Rica and figure out everything living there. Now for, for a taxonomist, this, this didn't really make sense because you, know, you think about groups and the groups are not unique in most cases to a small area, right? So you want to think about clades. So there was this sort of divide and Norm spent some time as a program officer at the um, National Science Foundation. And in, in those uh, days and those times there in collaboration with Quentin Wheeler, uh, Diana Lipscomb and other people, uh, um, Jim Woolley, they came out with this program, the uh, Planetary uh, Biodiversity Inventories. And, and Norm actually, after he left um, NSF, um, wrote this uh, uh, proposal, which was funded and was extremely successful, was also uh, uh, a platform for mentoring um, students, uh, um, not only in the US, but uh, all over um, the world. And I, I, I want to, to, um, to finish uh, these few words about Norm with, uh, with uh, sort of a personal uh, note for me today, the day Norm passed away on April 8th uh, uh, last year, I, I, was, I was shocked. I mean, like many others, I mean, I just have never thought about, you know, the world of arachnology um, without Norman Plutnik. I mean, he, he'd been there when I started uh, um, in the mid eighties. And he was, you know, sort of like someone you knew was there. And if you had a question or you wanted to, um, um, you know, chat with him as a sounding board. Um, there he was. So all of a sudden, um, we were shocked with the news that Norm um, isn't there. And this just happened a few weeks after we had gone over the proofs of this book. We had been working during the previous year, uh, Spiders of the World and Natural History. They, that, that, that was a project that was led by Norm and it was done in collaboration with uh, Peter Jagger in Germany, Rudy Jockey in Belgium, uh, Martin Ramirez in uh, Buenos Aires, and Robert Raven in, in Brisbane, in Queensland, and myself. And it just seems so tragic that Norm had not seen the, uh, the final, um, uh, lived to see the, the final product for which you know, he had this vision of this book. And um, so, I was just thinking about this. I was really depressed about the news. 
And I remember, you know, and, and I posted this at the time in Norm's wall in Facebook, having read how some of the stars that we see in the night sky uh, um, have long since uh, uh, died. They just aren't there. We just see the light, but the star isn't there. And I thought that I think uh, Norm um, is, is going to be like that. You know, he, he was clearly one of the brightest stars in, in, uh, in our arachnological universe. And I think he will continue to shine for many years to come. So I think this award that so generously uh, Will uh, Pladnik and uh, his family set up, it's a wonderful um, uh, homage to, to a man that I think has influenced uh, all of us in arachnology in one way um, or another. And uh, with that, I would like to pass on the, the virtual microphone to my colleague, uh, Mark Harvey in uh, Perth, Western Australia, to talk uh, a little bit more about the, um, the award. So Mark, there we go. Thank you, Gustavo. Thank you, Greta. Thank you, everyone. Good morning, everyone. It's uh, bright and early here in Australia. I'm just gonna share my screen, everyone. get it going. Here we go. Um, thank you, Gustavo. I, I suddenly became quite emotional listening to all of that. And um, hang on, I've shared the wrong screen. Um, and um, look, I'll keep going. Yeah, I've become quite emotional thinking about Norm and Norm's contribution to our technology, um, not just to spider research. As Gustavo said, he also worked on Ricinia Leards and was, knew a lot about other arachnids as well. He was passionately um, disinterested in mites and ticks, but everything else seemed to grab his fancy as well. But uh, for those of you who have spent time in the field with Norm, um, hang on, I, I do need to change this screen because... Um, Stop the share. New share. How am I looking? Really professional down here in Australia? <laughs> Let's try that one. No. Can you see just the screen or you can see my notes on the left hand side? It, just the screen, Mark. It looks great. Oh, okay, good. Okay, good. I'll keep going then. Now I'm looking professional. Um, so yes, yeah, so um, no, I'd like to acknowledge that I'm meeting on the traditional lands of the Wachuk Noongar people in here in Western Australia and pass my respects to their elders past, present and emerging. As um, uh, Gustavo has said, um, this award was set up for um, outstanding... Uh, It's been made possible by the generosity of Will Platnick and the Platnick family. And it was designed to acknowledge um, and celebrate outstanding early career researchers who are members of the American Arachnological Society and who are no more than six years post PhD. I know that Will's here online. I haven't seen Will since he was a baby. So g'day Will, how are you? Hope you're keeping well. Sorry about your father, etc. cetera. Um, the award criteria was set up quite specifically. Um, as Gustavo has said, Norman was very passionate about morphological taxonomy. And so the criteria were to be based on the quantity and quality of taxonomic publications that had been published or accepted for publication. And the main judging criteria will be that the applicant's publication record shows that commitment to morphological taxonomy. Um, there was going to also be looking at the creativity in the approach and the method of dissemination of that research that keeps taxonomy relevant. That'll also be considered. And we also um, made sure that we looked at performance relative to opportunity as well in case there were career interruptions. The, um, the selection panel that the executive committee of the society put together was myself, uh, Brent Opel from the USA, Chris Reams from Brazil, Hannah Wood from the USA, and Zhu from China. So we accepted all of the nominations and sifted through them. 
Um, four were received in the end, which was a, a good number. They're all extremely high quality. Um, hopefully in future years, we'll get more applications than just four, but those that we did receive were, were excellent in, their, in their, um, the areas that they covered. Unfortunately, one of them was deemed ineligible. One of the criteria that we set up that both the nominators and the nominees must be current members of the American Aeronautical Society to be eligible. So we're only able to uh, judge one, uh, sorry, leave out one of, the, one of the applicants and judging on just the three. So the winner, uh, this PhD was conferred in 2017. Um, by the time of submission, it published 26 papers, including 19 as the first author, 53 new species, including a wonderful monograph on a very large spider genus. Um, so that's true to Norman's views on how taxonomic research should be done in terms of monographs. There was a lovely phylogeny of the spider family Sicariidae and many smaller publications covering morphology, phylogenomics and phylogenetics of various different spider taxa. And the panel was um, deeply impressed by the detailed observations that were taken in, in doing these revisions, including a lots of um, microscopic details of spiders that were included in the, in the revisions. And so the winner is of the inaugural Norman Platnick Award for Taxonomic Research, Dr. Ivan Magalhães. Congratulations. Is Ivan here with us today? I saw him there earlier. I don't know if, um, Sydney, could you um, maybe spotlight Ivan? Um, Yvonne, actually raise your hand so you come up to the main view or up to the front, front of the view. <laughs> oh, I, can, I think I can spotlight, there we go. There you are, you can't hide. All right, everybody, our huge round of applause. Congratulations. <laughs> um, we won't uh, make you say any words, but you're welcome to if you want to, um, uh, but mostly just on behalf of the American Arachnological Society and arachnologists around the world, um, thank you for your inspiring early career uh, contributions. And we're so grateful that you're um, in arachnology and are applying your talents um, toward advancing our knowledge of the diversity of, of, uh, of uh, arachnids and spiders. Um, I think you are a very appropriate honoree for the first Norm Platnick Award. <laughs> I wish we could just unmute and have, uh, I think actually we will unmute everyone in just a moment. Um, and then we can have a cacophonous round of applause um, for uh, from everyone. Um, and then we'll stick around for a little bit and be as social as we can in this awkward Zoom space, but uh, in chat with one another. Um, uh, so, um, Yvonne, I see you're unmuted. I don't want to put you in the spotlight at all, but... Um. Uh, as I, I, I wish I could elaborate some words, but I'm in shock, so... <laughs> all I want to say is thank you very much. and. Uh, I think that the initiative is is great. I think Norman would be delighted to to see uh, an award for spider systematics on his name, and I think that it's it's a wonderful initiative because uh, taxonomy and systematics are not valued enough. And I, I, I say that as an early career in, in the area, and I see that. Uh, Many of the job postings today are for genomics and, and climate change, which are all important, but I think that some of this research uh, uh, needs to build on taxonomic work. And I, I think that it's wonderful that uh, Will uh, decided to put an, an, an award in, in the honor of his, his father, and I'm tremendously honored to be uh, the first person to, to, to earn this. So thank you very much. Thank you, Yvonne. Um, I also want to um, acknowledge uh, Will Platnick um, is here and, uh, and we are just deeply, deeply grateful um, for your contributions. 
Um, and I hope you feel continuously the deep love and respect that um, you so many hold for your father, his legacy. I love Gustavo's words that the that star will continue to shine brightly for a long, long time. Um, beyond our lifespans, it's uh, it's uh, amazing what Norm contributed. Um, I also very much want to thank the selection committee um, and uh, multiple people were part of the conversation for how to best target this award. And um, I thank all of you at the various stages and um, uh, and Mark for taking without reservation. I think it was the quickest response I've gotten to a request for. I guess for some uh, committee work, uh, Mark, when I reached out with an invitation and um, responded within milliseconds that he would be honored and grateful to hear that. So I'm, I'm grateful to him. Freddie, you taught me to say no to as many invitations as you say <laughs> yes to, but that one, I didn't, I didn't even think twice. That was an automatic. Yeah. <laughs> Loved yeah. every minute of it. Well, thank you, thank you. And we'll be continuing this. Please keep this uh, honor in mind and nominate folks that are appropriate um, in the future. So that ends our formal programming of the evening. Um, I, I really love the narrative of the night um, with the uh, representation of the magnificent depth and contributions and breadth of impact um, by from Norm's work uh, in, particular and um, and how that dovetails with uh, May Diane's um, excellent example of the value of looking closely at these species uh, and documenting natural history and publishing it so it can be pieced together to help us understand the fundamental causes and influences of why these species look the way they do and um, and uh, the value of that deep focus across uh, decades. So thank you for your inspiration, May Diane. Um, 